Hey everyone and welcome back to part two of our lecture series on the Koopman operator, which is going to be about the eigen decomposition of this operator. This means that we want to decompose it into a set of eigenfunctions, eigenvalues and the associated modes or later called Koopman modes that determine the relative importance of each of these functions uh, when it comes to reconstructing the state of the system. So the setting was, as we introduced it in the previous video, that we want to study nonlinear dynamical systems of this type, where we have a state x, this is uh, usually a vector in Rn at each time point k, and f iterates this forward or flows the state forward in discrete time to produce a new state. And since it's a nonlinear system, this can be very hard to analyze, where the Koopman operator allows us to uh, take a linear perspective, but we have to trade this for infinite dimensions. What we mean by this is that the Koopman operator acts on this observable function psi that maps the state x to an observed quantity z. So this can be seen in this diagram here, whereas we have a nonlinear system uh, on the left side where the flow map propagates the state. We have a linear system on the right hand side where the Koopman operator propagates forward in time this observable function, which means the Koopman operator acts on the function. And before we dive into the calculation of these eigenfunctions and then later on how to do this numerically, I would like to take a small recap for linear systems and then motivate this how to use it for, for Koopman later on. So if we study linear systems, then we have a system of this type, xk plus 1 is equal to a times xk, where a is now an n by n matrix. And if we see this rule, this evaluation, then we can simply say that the state at point k is a raised to the kth power times the initial state x0. Okay, so we have gained nothing for now, but um, what we can do now is we can study the eigenvalue and eigenvector decomposition of our matrix A. So a short recap is shown here in this box where we have right eigenvalue vectors. If this is the equation for an individual pair of eigenvector P and eigenvalue lambda. And this is sort of the, the matrix notation for this, AP times lambda P, where lambda is now a diagonal matrix containing all the eigenvalues on the diagonal. And we have similarly left eigenvectors where we multiply the eigenvectors from the left side. Um, and the, the eigenvalues are the same, which can be easily shown by transposing these equations. Okay, so what we can do now is we can simply introduce the eigenvalue decomposition. So let's assume we have linearly independent eigenvectors, then this matrix is invertible, which means the matrix A can be expressed as, well, the, we can switch this, right, P times lambda because it's a diagonal matrix, so A is P times lambda times P inverse, and so what we get is XK is P times lambda times P inverse raised to the kth power x0. Okay. And so you see if I raise this to power k, what I get is P times lambda times P inverse times P times lambda times P inverse times P times lambda P inverse. And so you see we always have in the middle P inverse times P products. So what we get in the end is P lambda raised to the kth power P inverse x0. Right? Simply by you know, multiplying this and then cancelling out P times P inverse. So what we see here is a new system, right? identical to what the one before. And what we can now do is we can use our P matrix to introduce new coordinates, right? So it's a linear system, so we can simply change the basis if you wish. Um, so we do a coordinate 
change and define x to be p times a new state y or other way around y times or is equal to q times x. So what I'm using here is that um, p and q def uh, define a dual basis so we can you know, take the inverse and do it like this. And if we do so, then what we can simply find is that we, you know, multiplying with p inverse from the left. So this would give me um, a yk here and a y0 here. So. Is, and now we have this large lambda matrix raised to the kth power, which means we raise lambda 1 till lambda n to the kth power. And this is really nice because now we have decomposed our system by this coordinate change into a set of independent states, you know, this diagonal matrix shows us that these are independent and these behave dynamically according to the eigenvalues. Right? And let's study this at a small example here where I will simply introduce three small matrices um, where we have two real eigenvalues that are both uh, an absolute value smaller than one. Right? For details you can have a look at the, the linear systems video that we have seen before. Um, and then we are going to study two more systems where we have a complex conjugate pair, meaning the system oscillates with spectral radius uh, equal to one and smaller than one, which means this is um, periodic and this is stable and should go to the origin eventually. And so the details how we did this doesn't matter. So what we see here is the, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of these three systems. And now we can visualize what's going to happen. And then so you see, two real eigenvalues, uh, one of them is a smaller than one, one is greater than one, which means we have a stable direction and we have an unstable direction. And these are the eigenvectors 0, 1, so meaning pointing upwards, and square root of 2 and minus square root of 2, which means it points to the right and downwards. So you see exactly this behavior. Two same plots, left is the vector field, and on the right plot you see trajectories of the system where they move from the top, you know, along the stable direction and then to the bottom right along the unstable direction. So an eigen decomposition allows us to really study a system very systematically. Right? And if we now consider the system that is stable, so we have just a, a pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues with absolute value 1, you see that the system simply goes in circles, which you see in the vector field and also in these trajectories. And third case is where we have a stable system, meaning that the eigenvalues are smaller than one in absolute value. And we have a similarly looking vector field, but these trajectories now spiral into the origin. Okay, so this is what's very, very interesting and useful for linear systems. And now comes the Koopman perspective. We want to do this for nonlinear systems. So what this means is that we take our operator psi, sorry, k, and we decompose it into a sequence of what we call Koopman modes, Koopman eigenvalues, and these Koopman eigenfunctions. So this is the whole or the main motivation to study systems through the Koopman lens. If we have means to approximate this operator, then we can compute eigenvalues and eigenfunctions and study systems very similarly to what we have seen here for truly linear systems. And so the question may arise, why does this framework gain so much interest right now? And the answer will be given in the next videos where we study how we can approximate this numerically. And this is the reason why we can now use data to really learn something about nonlinear systems. So stay tuned and see you in the next video.